If you would take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 61, starting in verse 1. Isaiah, 6, Isaiah 61, verse 1, and reading on to verse 3. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. You know, as we come into the Christmas season, we talk a lot about the coming Christ, the coming Messiah, the things He's going to do. But when you read in Isaiah 61, and this is the, the prophecy given in this chapter for the coming Messiah, one thing becomes clear. Everything is about to change. Everything is going to change. If you read these three verses in Isaiah 61 again and look at them very closely, because when we look at them initially, we see all these good things. We see where he says, I'm going to heal the brokenhearted. I'm going to console those who mourn. I'm going to preach liberty to the captives. But look at the second part. You see where he's talking about captives, mourning. He's talking about those who are oppressed, the poor. He's talking about this is the current condition. Here is what I'm bringing. He's identifying something that exists now and something that's going to come in time. You see, when Jesus comes into the room, he doesn't leave it the way it is. In all honesty, what he does is he turns it upside down. And he says, when I come as a Messiah, that's exactly what I'm going to do, but it's going to be for your betterment. Not to leave you worse off than what you were before, but to give you something better, something you've never known before. And that's terrifying. When we're given something that we don't understand, it scares us. I know throughout my life different challenges that I've faced. Whenever something new came at me, even though it was for my good, I would oftentimes feel uneasy, even a little insecure, because I didn't understand it. And that's exactly what we find happens to Israel when Jesus comes on the scene. They do not understand Him. They do not know, understand what He's saying, what His purpose is and they start lashing out. They start lashing out. But he told them right here in Isaiah 61, if they would pay attention, if we would pay attention, we would see, this is what God's plan is for me. God's plan for me is to give me something good, to heal me, to proclaim liberty to me, to open up the prison for me. He's to comfort me, to console me, to give me joy, to give me beauty, to give me praise. These are the things that God's given me because I don't possess these things on my own. I know just a great example. I learned so much from my kids. Being a dad and a husband, I've learned so, so much over the years. And I know with my kids, the moment they were born, the moment I held them in my hands, I thought, man, they're perfect. They're perfect. They're good, good kids. They're my kids. And then they grow. And my attitude changes slightly where I look at him and say, that's my kid. That's my kid. He didn't inherit that trait from me. That came from his mother. But that's my kid right there. They're still my kid. I still love them. But the thing is, I have to teach them. It's really when I'm holding them in my hands, it's a blank slate. It's a blank slate right there. I know that they're mine. I know that I love them. I know that nothing will ever change that but it's a blank slate and I have to teach them. God looks at you and me today and He looks at us and He says, you are a blank slate. You don't know the goodness of God, but I'm going to teach it to you. I'm going to walk you through what it is that I'm creating inside of you. And this is exactly what He told Israel was going to happen because when you look at Isaiah 61 through the prophet, you're saying when the Messiah comes, He's going to find you in prison. 
but he's going to show you what it is to be set free. He's going to see you in mourning. He's going to teach you what it is to have joy. He's going to see you poor and broken hearted, but he's going to teach you what it is to be wealthy and comforted. That's what Isaiah 61, the first three verses are saying. He's going to find you in this condition. He's going to move you over to this condition over here. So Isaiah is telling them, don't be afraid. Things are about to change. But it's for your good. And that's exactly what God taught me as being a father. As I held my children in my hands, it was saying, times are changing. But it's good. As a matter of fact, if you take your Bibles and you turn on over to Matthew chapter 3, go ahead and turn there with me. We start getting kind of into the Christmas story, just kind of dipping our toe in a little bit this morning. But we're going to read about John the Baptist. Now John is considered to be, even by Christ himself, the greatest of all the prophets in Scripture. And do you know something incredible about John? Kids, this is great trivia for you. Because John the Baptist was the greatest prophet in all Scripture who never performed a single miracle. He never performed a single miracle, but he's considered the greatest because he prepared the way for Jesus Christ. Now in preparing the way, we want to look at what he did. And when you look in in this passage here in Matthew chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 1. And it says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent! For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt round his waist, and food, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. And were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, Broad of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse out his threshing floor and will gather his weed into the barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let's pause here for just a moment. Verse 2 of what we just read. We're going to kind of take it piece by piece. But verse 2 and what we read, what was the message John preached? Repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's saying, now listen, because Christ is coming, we've got to start getting some things right you need to start moving from one area of your life to another area of your life. Remember what we read in Isaiah 61. It says that God's going to find us in prison. He's going to find us bound. He's going to find us oppressed. He's going to find us with all these things. John says we need to get ready for the coming of God. And he does this by telling them to repent of their sins, to get it right with God, so that they're ready for when He comes. Now, repent is kind of an odd word. It's an old word. A lot of the kids may not know what it means. But kids, here's what repentance means, okay? This is really easy to remember. If I'm headed one direction, repentance means I stop. I say, this is not the right way to go. This is a bad direction. And I turn, and I walk the opposite way. Meaning, I don't want to do those things ever again. I'm walking away from them. John says, the things you've been doing are wrong You need to repent and ask God to forgive you so you're ready when the Messiah comes. So the people would go to John, they'd get baptized, and it said they started confessing their sins. They started laying them out, saying, I don't want this, I don't want this life, I want to get away from it, I want to lay it down and be done. A desire to change. And John says that this is the first step to preparing the way for the kingdom of God. 
Now when you start reading these passages, you see where the Pharisees and Sadducees came. And John has some pretty harsh language for these guys. He calls them vipers. He calls them snakes. Why? Well, church, this is where it might get a little personal. Because when he looked at the religious elite, they thought the position, they thought their money, they thought their power put them above everybody else. And John says, your works don't show that you're sorry for anything you've done. You're proud and arrogant. You don't think you need a Savior. And he tells them the same thing he told the others, repent. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. That phrase is so important right there. Because he so often, so often we make the mistake, we just go up and we say, God, I feel conviction, I'm sorry. And we turn, we walk away. But the thing is, we don't do anything to actually change. We're not laying down the old self. What I'm trying to do is purchase fire insurance. To say, in case everything goes wrong, in case I don't make it home tonight, I want to know that I'm okay. God says, this isn't going to work. The fruit has to be worthy. You have to do things that are worthy of repentance. And you say, Pastor, is that works based? No, 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 no. I'm talking about sincerity. Actually meaning what it is that you're saying and doing. To say, I am truly, in my heart of hearts, I am sorry for the things that I've done. I don't want this life. I don't want to be in prison anymore. I don't want to be burdened by the things of the past. I don't want to carry this junk around anymore. I need a Savior. God, forgive me. And to actually call out in sincerity to Christ and be forgiven. That was the problem. You see guys like the Pharisees come into John's baptism. They don't mean a thing. They just want to be seen. And John's saying, that's not going to work. That is not works worthy of repentance. Jesus said he came to set the captives free. Boy, how ridiculous would it be if I'm in prison and the guard, he's got the door open. He says, okay, you're free to go. Go home. I want to go home. He says, well, you got to get up. No, I'm comfy. But the door's open. I know. I'll go there someday. It's open. I can get there anytime I want, but I'm comfy right now. What would be wrong with me? I deserve a swift kick in the rear end. Get up and get out the door. But so often, that's the attitude we have in church, isn't it? God's opened the door. He says, you're free. We say, no, I'm comfy. He says, you're free. You just have to let go of the old stuff. Yeah, but I don't want to right now. I can do that later. I can, get, I can get right later. God, I don't need to go there right now. John says the kingdom of heaven is near. There's no time to wait. As a matter of fact, Scripture says elsewhere in the New Testament, it says that today is the day of salvation. Today is the day. Not tomorrow, not the next day. Today is the day. When Jesus gave the prophecy through the prophet Isaiah... He said, I'm coming to set the captives free. One thing that I take away from that is that when he sets me free, i got to start making a decision. What do I want to do with it? It's not going to be there forever. What am I going to do with it? Am I going to act upon the calling of God? Or am I going to let him pass me on by? You've got to make a decision. You can't just play games with it the rest of your life. You have to make a decision. As a matter of fact, when we go even further into this message from John, he tells us in verse 10, it says, Even now, the axe is laid to root of the tree, and every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but there comes one who is greater than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn again that last verse that's an old phrase a lot of the kids may not know it some of the adults may not know it but let me explain it briefly a threshing floor in ancient times was a place where you'd separate the chaff from the wheat chaff was basically just a shell around the wheat you couldn't crush it and make it into bread until you got rid of that shell that chaff 
So they would go into a, a, an area, a threshing floor, just an area marked off where you can beat your grain. And you'd take a stalk of wheat and you would pound it on the ground. And you would pound it and you would pound it and you would pound it. And the wind, when it would blow, it would carry off the shell of that wheat, that chaff. It would carry it away. But the wheat was heavy enough that it would fall straight down to the ground, separating the chaff from the wheat. The chaff was no good. The wheat is what was precious. Now you're reading this in, in this passage, and it's saying that this is God's threshing floor. And repentance is His way of separating the chaff from the wheat. Unless you take the shell off, the wheat cannot be used. As a matter of fact, you see this even further in Scripture, and I want to show you this with the disciple Peter. If you would take your Bibles and turn to the book of Luke, and we're going to look in chapter 22 for just a moment, because there's a couple different examples. I'm going to give you examples today of both chaff and wheat, but I want to take you to Luke 22 first and turn to verse 31. Because to me, this really shows the heart of many Christians, even the heart of the modern church. It says in verse 31 of Luke 22, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall, shall not crow this day before you deny me three times. Until you deny three times that you know me. Peter says, I'm willing to die with you. You ever feel that way in your, in your walk with God? Lord, I'll go with you no matter where you go, I will go. No matter where you travel, I will travel. I will not leave you, Father. We're stuck together like glue. We're not going to be separated. But here God tells Peter, and boy, this is telling right here. Satan has asked for you to sift you as wheat. He's not, Satan. He's not saying Satan's going to sift him. He's saying, I'm going to allow Satan to test you. That we can start getting rid of what, what remains. And he tells Peter, he said, this is going to be a trial. This is going to be a test for you. A test is not pleasant. My kids, I'll put them to test every once in a while. We homeschool our children. They'll get their school out. and It's time to take a test. And every so often they'll look at me and say, Dad, Dad, can you help me? It's like, no, I can't, son. This is a test. I've already taught you everything you need to know. You know the answer. You just got to put it down on paper. You can do this. God tells Peter, he says, this is your test. And he says, I'm praying for you. I'm right here with you. But he said, this is your test. Peter says, Lord, I'll never leave. I'm tougher than the other guy. God looks at Peter and he says, you're going to fail. You're going to deny you even know me three different times. You're going to tell people you don't know me. But look at what Jesus says after this. Because man, this part just really, it just really gets me. He says, when you have returned to me. God says, you're going to come back. He says, when you return to me. You see, in this whole passage and everything we read this morning, it has all been about, every bit of it, it's all been about coming back to Christ. The purpose of Christ's mission on this earth was to bring people to Himself. That was His purpose on earth, to make a way for us to know God, to have a relationship with Him. He said, I've come to set the captives free. Peter doesn't even realize the struggles he's been having all this time. He's failed more than once. He's been struggling. God says, Peter, here's the thing. He says, you're going to be tested another time. You're going to be tested, Peter. And he says, you, you are. You're going to fail. You're going to deny me three times. You're going to fail me. But he, says, he tells Peter, and I'm going to put it in my own vernacular for a minute, but Peter, you love me. I know that you love me. 
And I know that you're not going to be perfect, but you want to be. You want to be with me. So Peter, because of that, I know you're going to return to me. You're going to come back to me. And when you do, strengthen the brethren. But I want you to notice something. When Peter denies Christ, when he fails, and you go to verse 61 and 62, look what happens. It says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Bitterly he cried. Why? You say, Pastor, why did Peter cry? Because for him he thought there was no hope for him. Remember, Jesus had not died on the cross yet. The blood had not been shed. According to what Peter thought, according to the law, he is to die now. There's no hope for Peter. And he realizes the full weight of sin and what it cost. I sinned. I failed. I deserve to die. And he's crying and weeping bitterly because he loves the Lord with all his heart. And he failed. And he failed miserably. And he can't turn to God now and say, I'm sorry. Because the man's on his way to the cross. And Peter's understanding is still limited. We know this from Scripture. He cannot understand everything that you and I do today. So he's alone. Boy, church, when you understand what it is to be captive, you understand how precious grace really is. Here, Peter right here has lost all hope. And he feels the full weight of that sin on his shoulders. And all he can do is weep. Because in Peter's mind, his life is now over. But go back to Isaiah 61. Jesus told us the Messiah was coming to set the captives free. Peter's just become a captive. But he's come to set him free. When Jesus dies on the cross and he reveals himself to Peter, hope starts coming back. And remember what Jesus does to Peter? There on the side of the sea, he asked Peter three times, do you love me? You say, Pastor, why did Jesus do that? Oh, Jesus forgave Peter a long time ago. He forgave him before this, but there was a second part. Remember, he told Peter, when you have been tested and when you've been proven faithful, he says, go and strengthen the brethren. Go strengthen your brethren. He tells Peter, do you love me? He says, yes. He says, then go feed my sheep. Three different times. Now you see where Peter succeeded, but here's the challenge, church. Other people did not succeed. Other people did fail. As a matter of fact, you look at Judas Iscariot. He denied Christ. He betrayed Him, turned Him in to others to be crucified. I believe He could have been forgiven had He sought the face of God, but He didn't. He gave up and gave in to His grief and His, his trial. Now you see later on as well, you see the disciples, they also failed Christ. They ran from Him in the Garden of Eden. Or Garden, Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me. They ran from Him in the Garden of Gethsemane. They fled. They denied Him. But again, Jesus came to what? Set the captives free. And He forgave them when they came back to Him. Now there's another character in Scripture, and I'm going to turn you all the way back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 4, I know we're going way, way, way back in Scripture. But in Genesis chapter 4, verse 5, we're introduced to a man named Cain. Now we all know the story of Cain and Abel pretty well doesn't end very well for either one of them. But in this passage, God describes exactly the nature of sin. And I want you to catch this right here as we start in Genesis chapter 4, starting in verse 5. We're just going to read down a few verses to verse 7. It says, But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. 
and its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. God tells Cain right there, He tells him exactly the same thing that He was telling Peter, the same thing He was telling His disciples. He was telling them all the same thing, even those at John's baptism, the same thing. Sin's desire is for you. But if you do well, you will be accepted. And you will even rule over it. God's desire for you is good. It has always been good. From the very beginning it's been good. That's why we celebrate Christmas. This was God's desire for you. If you will accept it. This is His desire for you. And He tells us in His Word. He says, if you do well, you will be accepted. You might ask the question this morning, Pastor, what is doing well? What does it mean for me to do well? To repent. To repent is to do well. To mean it with all your heart. To come forward and say, God, I am sorry. I am sorry for the things I have done. I am sorry for the man, for the woman that I've been or that I've become. And I want to come back to you. Kids, it's no different for you than it is for us. It's the same. There's not a kid's gospel. It's one gospel for you and me. I'm a, I'm a young man by some standards. I'm certainly not a kid. But God tells me, He says, what He's telling me to do is no different than what He's telling you to do. Because for both of us, we're both God's children. And this is what He says. You have to come to God and say, I'm sorry. You've got to come to Him. For us adults, He says, we got to be humble. Why do we have to be humble? Because of right here, what we just read in Genesis. Sin lies at the door. And sin's desire is that it should rule over you. Romans 6.23 tells us, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Look how it turned out for Judas when he gave himself over to sin. When he gave himself over to grief and bitterness. Look what happened to him. Look what happened to Cain when he gave over himself to the desires of sin that was coming and knocking on his door. Look what happened to Cain. But then again, on the other hand, look what happened to Peter when he repented and turned back to God. Look what happened to the rest of the disciples when they turned back and came back to Jesus Christ saying, I'm sorry. Look at what happened to imperfect people that came to the Messiah and said, we desire to be yours. This baby came in the world to set the captives free. Isaiah 61. He came to set the captives free. He came to give joy to those who had no joy. Peace to those who had no peace. Hope to those who had no hope. A future to those who have no future. You may look at this today and say, I've always believed that that's a good story, but it doesn't apply to me. I'm going, I understand that. I really do. I understand that. It's a good story, but it doesn't apply to me. Let me tell you, it absolutely applies to you. Because you are created in the image of God. He died for you. If you were the only person alive, this baby would have come for you. This baby would have died for you. He said, I've come to set you free. But you've got to make that decision to say, I want to be free. I want Jesus in my life. I want to know the Savior. I want to have something better. You've got to make that decision. And nobody else can make it for you. Not a single soul can make that decision for you. John the Baptist was the greatest prophet in all of Scripture. Never performed one miracle. Not one. All he said was repent because Jesus is coming. That's all he did. Repent for Jesus is coming. One day, church, we're going to hear that trumpet sound. One day we're going to hear it. One day we're going to see the sky break. And I'm going to get to see my Jesus coming back on a white horse. 
I'm going to see Him coming back on the clouds of glory. I'm going to see the hands that were pierced for me. I'm going to see the feet that had the nail driven into them. And I want to be ready when He comes. Are you ready today? Are you ready to meet Jesus Christ? Music can start making your way forward. You know, kids, I'm going to share with you, when I was a little boy, I got saved at a young age. I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior at seven years old. Seven years old. There was so much I didn't understand about the Bible. So much. But I understood this. I understood this one thing. Jesus loves me. I understood that one thing. Jesus loves me. And I want to tell you kids today, Jesus does. He loves you. There's nothing to be afraid of because He's right here. He's right here in this room and He's speaking to you. So as we have the altar call, I tell you kids too, this altar is open for you as much as it is open for the adults because you need Jesus too. To the adults, I give you this challenge. Going to church alone is not enough to make you godly. Knowing the Bible verses, knowing all the right things to say, it's not enough to make you a good Christian. You have to believe it. You have to believe it deep inside of here. When everything else is stripped away, when you've lost it all, that that belief in Jesus still remains. That's what you need to be right with God. You may be someone today saying, Pastor, I think I'm doing pretty good. Christianity was never about doing pretty good. Christianity has always been about humbling ourselves at the foot of the cross. It's always been about that. If you're not humble before God, you cannot be right with Him. You must be humble before Jesus Christ. When when John the Baptist preached the message to the masses, he said, there's a day that's coming when the Romans will no longer be in power. There's a day that's coming when wickedness will flee. And all people will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He said, prepare for that day. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Who would have ever thought one day, one day a man and his wife would come into a small town named Bethlehem and a baby would be born. The baby who is Christ the Lord. How many people laid their heads on their pillows that night not knowing that the Messiah was born? How many people went to bed that night thinking that nothing would ever change? And here the prophecy was being fulfilled right in their back door. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords laid in a manger. We dress this up, we make it look nice, and it's beautiful to look at. But you want to know the reality of that day? The town that they went in was crowded. It was absolutely full because of tax time. There was no room in the inn. There was nowhere for them to go. A woman about to give birth. There was no bed for her to lie on. They end up in a stable. A stable. Most scholars believe it was just a a small cave that people used to keep their livestock. Cold, damp, dark, lonely. And Jesus came into the world in a dirty old stable didn't even have a crib to lay him in they took a trough full of straw and they laid him in that the savior of the world laid in a dark cave and he did it for you and me he did it for us he did it for us that baby came into the world right there and left this world right there the whole time saying, I love you. Do you love me? It's the only question that matters this morning. Do you 
love Jesus with all your heart this morning. I'm not asking you if you know a lot of scripture. I'm not asking you what church you go to. I'm not asking you anything about your life. I don't want to know about the mistakes you've made. It doesn't matter to me. I'm asking you one question. Just one. Do you love God with all your heart? Are you willing to turn from your sins and ask Jesus to be your Savior? The greatest gift. And all you have to do is say, I want it. Whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart, I invite you to this altar this morning. Accept the gift. Start a new life in Jesus Christ. Whatever needs you have, whatever prayer you need to pray for anything God has laid on your heart, I invite you this morning. Please come.